Today, when uh, we were talking about the task-oriented reaction patterns, we talked about attack, frustration, and direct action, conflict in choice, and pressure and resistance. Two important task-oriented reaction patterns are withdrawal and compromise. No? Uh, withdrawal, as you know, uh, would be the tendency uh, wherein you uh, decide uh, to you know, draw yourself back from the engagement. Okay. And compromise would be that uh, you go for an option which wasn't your choice. Uh, withdrawal and compromise deliberately, uh, you, know, you find that it has been left blank here. Uh, because uh, once we complete this unit, the next unit would be exclusively dedicated to withdrawal and compromise. The reason being uh, that out of uh, the six different types of task-oriented reaction patterns that we see here, Okay, four of them uh, you know, are of course uh, used by all of us, but withdrawal and compromise happens to be the most dominant pattern uh, that is seen by and large in all of us. Okay, and uh, because it has multiple dynamics attached to it, therefore we would also be uh, discussing withdrawal and compromise at length in the next module. We now come to uh, another type of uh, mechanism, what is called as damage repair mechanism. Now, the guiding uh, principle for the damage repair mechanism is that while executing a task in a given situation, okay, your ego has been hurt. Okay. Now, the insult that is created to the ego, there is an attempt to heal it. Okay. So, all these damage repair mechanisms are primarily intended to heal the wound that has been created to the ego. Fine. The first uh, damage repair mechanism is crying. Crying basically, uh, no, you can look at it from uh, no, more than one perspective. One is that there is a state of sadness. Sadness is one of the basic emotions. There is a state of sadness and crying is triggered by that state of sadness. Okay. That is one. Second and most important is that when you start crying, you basically try to regain the equilibrium, okay. the state which uh, you were in before you started crying. Okay after completing this period of bereavement. Okay? So, there is something uh, to be uh, bereaved about and this uh, whole process of bereavement encompasses crying as a pattern of behavior. Once that state is over, okay, you feel somewhere within a solace and that is the state of achieving emotional equilibrium. Okay? Usually, when you see people crying, you would realize that I uh, know there is a span uh, between which they can cry. No, it's not that you can endlessly cry. There could be periodic states. No, so you cry uh, for some time, then there is absolute uh, no silence for some time, and once again you start crying. That could be a possibility. Uh, say if you take a example of uh, crying where uh, intense bereavement is involved. Say for example one of your parent dies. Okay, this is the extreme state of bereavement. Okay. <coughs> and here crying could be periodically visible. No? So, after a lapse of certain time, once again you recollect some past experience memories and that makes you cry. Okay. If you are in a little uh, no, less intense type of a situation that has triggered crying, okay, could be that you cry and then you overcome it. Okay. So, this is uh, you know, uh, one of the damage repair mechanisms where an insult is created, you are hurt, you, your hurt makes you feel sad, it makes you cry. Once you have completed that cycle, uh, you feel as if you are uh, you know, somewhere saturated to certain extent in terms of your emotional hiccups that you were experiencing and hence you regain your state of emotional equilibrium. 
but in terms of uh, social acceptance of crying there is a difference okay and the difference is that uh, crying is most commonly seen in children they can cry for each and everything that they want okay it could start with uh, you know desire to have milk or desire to have food to it could be anything you no know, you want the sun you want the moon and you can cry for it you can throw your tantrums children uh, no they enjoy this privilege but once you start uh, growing up then uh, there are you no know, social ways of interpreting uh, your crying behavior so now as boys if you cry after a particular uh, age okay people will start telling you that you cry like girls okay and the moment you are told that you cry like girl this means that there is a social distinction that the girls can still enjoy the privilege of crying boys you uh, know have been withdrawn this facility now once you decide that this facility is withdrawn from the boys this means that there is some you uh, know ethical limit of crying behavior for the male child whereas females can enjoy you know crying at all stages of life okay um if uh, maybe if time permits later on i'll show you that there is a pattern of crying also okay in different culture people cry in a certain pattern okay and i have some visuals with me which basically you know shows uh, say for example in a tribal community a uh, woman who has lost one of the family members how she cries no and there is some type of uh, rhyming no so she speaks out something in a rhyming order okay and that is also the state of crying okay in another condition you, you know create the loudest of the voice okay uh, and that is uh, you know simultaneously supported by uh, shedding of tears that is crying in certain states you just keep quiet and that is also you no know, you simply tears roll down your eyes that is also crying okay and very interestingly uh, there is a pattern there but primarily instead of looking at the pattern of crying what we are primarily interested in is the fact that crying acts as a uh, repair mechanism for the damage that has been caused to the ego the second interesting uh, damage repair mechanism is talking it out now talking it out is basically repetitive talking uh, to others about some experience okay which basically one had and that experience has caused a great degree of damage to your ego it has uh, created an insult to your ego now what happens in the case of talking it out is say for example somebody somebody makes an entry into the room right now and i say is this the time to come okay it's 10 past 8 so go out of the room okay you feel humiliated okay you feel that okay uh, there is somebody you know who has been coming thrice or four times he has come here you no know, 10 15 minutes or even two days after 20 minutes but you didn't say anything why was it me okay the fact that now people would identify you that he was the one who was asked to leave the class okay is a great uh, insult to your ego now starts the process of talking it out you talk to others what did he teach today i know he talks only rubbish these are all common sensical things even i can say much better things than him okay i don't know why such courses are there i don't know why such instructors are there i don't know x i don't know why many 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 things you will be attaching to it. every time you do that there is some degree of satisfaction that you derive out of it remember one thing that talking it out about the individual would simply mean that you talk negative things about the source of insult to your ego it cannot be positive okay and the more and more you talk about the cause of uh, insult to your ego the more and more uh, degree of satisfaction you derive okay now this is what happens superficially psychologically what happens every time you start narrating to somebody say the uh, <coughs> lecture is over one of your uh, friend walks out okay and you ask him 
So what happened today? I know he would be talking only these things. Every day it's the same example. Every day it's the same con concept. Only words are different or at times. Okay. But I think even, uh, you know, if I am told to talk about it, I can talk much better than him. Okay. Bad appearance, bad sentence composition, bad, uh, you know, elocution, uh, bad at pronunciation, all types of you no know, negativities. Now, once you do that exercise, basically what happens, the experience that you had when the moment when you, are, when you were asked to leave the class, okay, that flashes back to you. Okay. And the tension that you had experienced within when you were asked to do that and you executed the task, that whole physical, uh, physiologically that entire experience gets reactivated. Okay. The phase is over you meet somebody else on the way towards your hall of residence and you say, oh, you know, today 8 o'clock morning I went there, I was 10 minutes late and this man tells me go out of the class. Oh, who is interested going to the class? I just thought oh, it was raining outside, therefore I came inside. Okay. Now, there could be a different way of narrating the whole story, but primarily what psychologically happens is that this experience of yours that you were asked to leave the class gets reactivated within you. The entire uh, sense that you had, okay, the tension that you had within, okay, that gets reactivated. You go, again, you know, third time you go back for uh, lunch and again you talk to a couple of your friends. Today this is what happened to me. You keep on, keep on talking to people about the same experience time and again. Okay. Now, more and more you talk about it, okay, more, or more and more your uh, you know, psychologically and physiologically you attain the same state that you experienced in the class. And this leads to what is called as desensitization. Desensitization is uh, that gradually uh, your physiological mechanism, your psychological mechanism does not reach the level okay, that it initially reached for a given stimulus because you have been overexposed to it. For example, uh, say uh, imagine of a, a police cop who for the first time had seen a dead body. Okay. Perhaps he would have experienced two, three sleepless nights. Okay. But then over a period of uh, time, you see so many, so many, you uh, know, mutilated bodies, dead bodies, all types of uh, crime scenes, uh, that this is no more a source of uh, tension for you. It is just one of the new case for you. Okay. This is what is called as desensitization. Okay. Uh, take another example. Uh, when for the first time you saw the news that there was a bomb blast in particular area, okay. say in Jammu and Kashmir there was a bomb blast, no? this news attracts your attention. Now if you hear it time and again, time and again, okay, whether there was a blast or not you do not care, because you do not belong to that area, that is simply a news item for you, do not care for such things. Rather, I have heard people know jokingly saying, Are, uh, there has been three days and there was no news of a bomb blast in JNK. Okay. This, this is basically an indicator of desensitization. <coughs> desensitization is uh, no, one of the uh, steps that is attained uh, no, in, the, in one of the psychotherapies called behavior modification technique. Now, behavior modification involves couple of steps, okay, we are not going into the details of it, but one of the steps involved in the behavior modification technique is that you expose the person repeatedly to the same stimulus that is a cause of problem for him or her, okay, to the level that finally the person concerned gets desensitized out of it. Okay. Uh, if you read uh, how uh, the, the behaviorists they came forward with learning theories, okay, the classical and the instrumental conditioning theories and if you uh, also see how behavior modification technique evolved as one of the therapeutic interventions, okay, you will find no great degree of discussion on 
desensitization. The word there you would find is systematic desensitization, okay? Because systematically it is introduced to you. Here, because you are doing it yourself and you are not aware of the technique, you do it unknowingly. <coughs> but in that process, you also desensitize yourself, okay? Now, what happens if you desensitize yourself? Time and again talking about the same experience with uh, different shades to the story. Every time, uh, you know, you desensitize yourself. And finally, you come forward with an experience, okay, that you find cozy enough to be integrated with your other experiences, okay. And therefore, you integrate it into your self-structure. And you say that, you know, uh, I have been a uh, ten-pointer all through. Uh, I attend classes, I do bunk, but I won't call it bunking. It's basically, you know, not attending classes which are not interesting, okay. Uh, but once in my life it happened, you know, that I was asked to leave the class, okay. Now it has been structured well with your earlier experiences, okay. That is no more a cause of, uh, you know, insult for you. Okay. This is what talking it out does. Okay. All of us for certain things do apply this technique. No? We do go for you know, ex excessively talking about the same experience to multiple sources. Time and again, time and again we do that okay. and in that process we get desensitized to it. Okay. I am sure anyone who says that I have never used this as a technique, we all do that. Okay. But there is a beauty in it, when you do it basically you retain the integrity of your ego, because once uh, damage is caused to your ego, it could be a great cause of concern, no? because it could lead to certain type of psychopathology. You safeguard yourself by using this technique. Now we come to the third technique, what is called as laughing it off. Laughing it off basically, you know, is a process where you have an experience, okay, and you just, you know, laugh it off, you laugh and you say, oh, what type of thing is this, okay. But basically, you elevate your emotional tension, okay, and also uh, you, uh, you know, see this experience in a much broader perspective. For, uh, say, you remember that uh, famous song of a film, from a film of Devanan, no? Har fikr ko dhuye me udata chala. So, it is that type of a thing, no, that you have really a cause of concern, but instead of getting concerned over the issue, you just, you know, laugh and shut it off, okay. But this laughter is not basically uh, intended to shut off the experience, but this is basically because you are able to analyze this experience in a much, much broader perspective, okay. Uh, say for example, uh, somebody <coughs> in a given context, you know, comments at you and you look at it in a much broader perspective and you know the reason why he said what he said, okay. Now, if you are able to look at it from that angle and then you see how mean that person was it, who thought this way and passed on this comment, okay. <coughs> Unless and until you are in a position to, you know, see really things from that broader perspective, uh, you know, this technique usually will not be utilized. Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, usage, okay, crying for example is too generously used. Okay, of course, there is a social moderator uh, which does not allow men to cry in public. There has also been research has shown that there is a pattern in terms of uh, you know, age dependent usage of crying as a technique. Uh, people in their middle age and afterwards, uh, men cry more compared to men in their earlier phases. Okay. So, childhood, everybody cries, then comes your uh, no, uh, early adolescent period when you cease to cry, okay. And then it is uh, in your uh, middle life when you start using it to certain extent and later on again uh, relatively more usage of crying. Women overall, they can continue doing that. But laughing it off comparatively, you would realize that this is not used generously as a damage repair mechanism. The reason being perhaps that uh, most of us are not capable of analyzing an event 
in a very broad perspective okay and unless and until you are able to do that laughing it off is not possible but remember one thing even though you laugh psychologically your emotional tension that you had experienced is again uh, you know reattained so it gets reactivated even though you are laughing it off and therefore <coughs> one of the <coughs> dangers with this technique is that in case you had the experience and you start laughing it off if this technique fails in that situation it can lead you to burst into tears okay uh, i'm sure uh, it's very difficult to have a real life situation uh, where you really see people like this but uh, very seldom you will come across you may come across people okay uh, who at one point had shown this as a uh, damage repair technique the next damage repair mechanism is seeking support okay this is basically you know you cling to derive affection and companionship and regain your state of equilibrium so basically say i am uh, in trouble a damage has been caused i uh, approach a person who i confide in it could be one of my parents it could be one of my siblings it could be one of my friends at times uh, it could be one of the inanimate objects okay you go and talk to your teddy bear okay what mother did to you uh adulthood uh, say you go and uh, talk to a god okay whom you worship and you convey the, your entire pain and suffering to him or her okay so basically all you do is that you try to gain a companionship the person who would definitely provide the shoulder to you you want to cry okay you want to share your uh, experience how insulting it was how damaging it was for your ego okay and all your companion has to do is to provide a shoulder at fine okay this is my shoulder you can rest on it now say whatever you want cry how much you want okay and this is how you attain your affection you try to attain your state of equilibrium okay that there is somebody who will certainly not reject me okay so that is uh, seeking support and the last damage repair mechanism is dreaming at nightmares now here what happens uh, you do not uh, know practice something in your uh, state of conscious awareness rather you again try to desensitize yourself to a traumatic experience so that it is accepted as an event of the past and once again integrated into your self structure without undue disruption now if i realize that the person whom i confide in perhaps might not extend the shoulder to me to share and cry because of certain reasons then i do not have anybody to share the, that experience with okay the possibility could be that i have uh, no either a direct representation of my real life experience or a symbolic representation of that in my uh, state of sleep when as a content of dream i visualize those things okay and once i regain my consciousness after i wake up i accept it as a content of dream but then still it is very very satisfying okay i'm sure uh, you know um, the dreams that you see if they are not frightening okay that does provide uh, some certain degree of satisfaction to you that because you have an a state of imaginary achievements there or a state of imaginary suffering which you say oh god it was only dream fortunately it didn't happen in reality okay now certain types of uh, dreams uh, where say let us take the same example uh, when you were asked to leave the class and you found it very insulting okay it could be a very direct representation in the dream okay uh, that you were asked to leave the class and the moment you started walking down the two stairs that you have uh, in the class rest of the class stood up and said no 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 we want him to sit in the class okay uh, 
uh, if anybody else has to go, you please leave the class, but my friend he cannot leave the class. Okay? You uh, say this could be an imaginary way of achieving what has been done to you. Okay? The source of insult to you is now asked to do what he instructed you to do. What was the cause of uh, damage for you? Okay? But there could be another way of looking at it. Say for example, if you are a person who is much more value oriented, okay, then you might start having a sense of guilt. Uh, see, I, have, I did so and I was asked to leave the class and see how mean I am. Even in dream I saw this and uh, my dream suggested that the instructor should leave the class. This is too mean of me. If you are you know, guided by such type of value orientation, then the content of your dream might change. Instead of having a very direct representation, okay, you may have a much more abstract representation of the experience. Okay. Um, you saw that you were riding back to your uh, hall of residence and you saw um, a buffalo lying on the road. Okay, was hit by probably a vehicle, okay, some wounds, a long tongue coming out of the mouth. Okay, and um, you just saw you know, that a small bird came there and sat on the dead buffalo and started chirping. And next morning you wake up and you say, what type of absurd dream was this? Okay, I see a buffalo on the road, I see a sparrow sitting over a buffalo. And chirping. You never realized that uh, the instructor was the buffalo and you were the sparrow. Okay? And great degree of damage that could be caused to the symbolic conversion. Okay? And great degree of joy that you could derive again out of a symbolic uh, no, a representation. That you see in the dream, you never understood what it was, but then it was satisfying. Okay? This is how you know, uh, dreams and nightmares they work. Okay? So, uh, these are uh, the basically uh, the damage repair mechanisms, uh, which are basically uh, tailor made to damage the, sorry, to repair the damage that has been caused to your ego. Okay? And once you apply this technique, you realize that you have been able to attain a state of uh, integrated ego structure that you earlier had with you. And um, it's nothing like good or bad in terms of using this. Uh, no. These are all basically guided to safeguard you from uh, getting into the trap of one or the other psychological problem. Okay. Because you had an experience which you uh, did not had a control over and therefore a mechanism was needed to help you regain your earlier state so that you do not uh, know, flow towards the direction of pathological behavior okay and therefore usage of any of these techniques is not at all detrimental okay it's perfectly normal to use these techniques now we will come to the last set of uh, mechanisms that we were supposed to discuss as part of this module where we would be talking about defense mechanisms the difference between the damage repair and the defense mechanism primarily is that damage repair mechanism are adopted after the damage is caused to the ego, whereas defense mechanisms are uh, no, mechanisms which are used by individual okay, anticipating the damage. So, in reality the damage has not been caused, but you somewhere perceive that a damage could be caused and in order to safeguard your ego, okay, you put these defenses beforehand. So, it is equivalent to say walking with a bodyguard. Okay. It is not that somebody has planned to kill you or somebody is coming to kill you. It is basically that you perceive a danger okay. and that perception makes you, you know, move along with a large number of bodyguards. So, it is equivalent to that. Second and technical distinction between these two mechanisms are that defense mechanisms are all unconsciously used. So, even though you might be using this as a technique okay, in a given situation, you consciously never will admit that this was a defense because this is unconsciously used. The first uh, defense mechanism is denial of reality. Okay? 
denial of reality primarily uh, means that it is meant to protect yourself from some unpleasant realities okay so uh, you basically you know refuse to perceive the problem or you per simply refuse to face it okay and this is how you protect yourself okay uh, if you have example share it with us uh, i know of a person <coughs> who has been into smoking uh, since his college days okay his old mother now stays with him okay and the mother till date pretends that she doesn't know that the son smokes okay this could be one of the examples of denial of reality okay because you have tried your best to groom up your child in a particular way the very fact that your child has been smoking right when he was with you during the college days okay makes you feel that perhaps you failed uh, you know giving the best that you could have done as a mother and hence in order to protect that structure uh, you simply pretend that fine uh, i am very sure my son can never do that you simply you know uh, do not accept it you know simply because the reality is unpleasant okay and this unpleasantness somewhere is associated with you okay so you would uh, somewhere feel that you uh, know i could be held responsible for the unpleasantness that is embedded in this situation and hence what you do is that you simply refuse to perceive it okay then comes second interesting uh, defense mechanism fantasy okay now fantasy is basically you know uh, a technique where one gratifies frustrated desires by certain imaginary achievements okay fantasy could be you know um, of a usually you know if you uh, put it on on a uh, continuum when you have the day dreaming okay day dreaming usually is uh, you know when uh, in a conscious state you keep on keep on visualizing and uh, you know fabricating the whole content of a given uh, situation the whole episode you can do that okay that is day dreaming but if that intensifies okay that is what is called as fantasy so in fantasy you have imaginary achievements but those imaginary achievements are extremely gratifying as if you have really attained it uh, say for example you appeared in the exam your end sem exam and uh, say you uh, somehow thought that you would be the 10 pointer and you are definitely going to get the uh, president uh, medal this year and then you know uh, with full of that feeling you sit there in the convocation hall to realize that somebody else's name has been announced okay a great degree of frustration for you okay and then uh, you could have some imaginary achievements okay you fantasize your fantasy you know tells you that okay uh, somebody else's name has been announced and uh, he goes there okay the chief guest and the guest of honor you no know, confers the award to him he comes down okay uh, he celebrates uh, there are people uh, you know who come to you who express their uh, uh, you know sense of uh, sorrow to you that you didn't uh, get it but definitely you were the one who actually deserved it and next day there is uh, you no know, uh, corigandam published in the newspaper saying that uh, the name of the person concerned who was given this medal was mist mistakenly uh, uh, no announced so the actual recipient is you so full celebration to the actual recipient and then there is a twist in the story you know so your name is published and this was one column news the corigandam was much more bigger and then the board decides that we will have a reconvocation and in this reconvocation only you will be invited and given this award okay and you could add all types of flavors to it you know 
you were very sad and you were going back to your hall when this whole cavalcade came to you and said, oh, hold on, hold on, we want to take you back to the ceremony ground. This medal actually belongs to you. Okay. So, uh, no, this is the whole story in fa fantasy. It depends on how stronger is your visualization capacity okay, and what actually you want to attain. Okay. Uh, there could be certain fantasies which can live longer with you. There could be few episodes which uh, has a shorter lifespan. Okay, uh, situations where you visualize it for some time and done. Okay, uh, in the other state, there could be situations where you really, you know, uh, stay with your fantasy. You repeatedly, repeatedly fantasize it till there is a greater degree of satisfaction that you derive out of it. Then we come to the third uh, defense mechanism: repression. Repression is basically a very different type of a technique. What it does is that it somewhere acts as a block which will not allow the painful, the dangerous desires to enter into your conscious awareness. But what it basically does is uh, that it will help you put that entire experience in a black box which will never ever be available to you. Okay. See, uh, understand, we will uh, understand two things which are closely associated with repression. One is that you encountered the situation, you have a conscious experience of what actually happened and that is your experience. You thought of something, you had some experience and you do not want it to resurface again. The dangerous desire or the experience that you have is known to you and you deliberately you know cover it up and put it in a corner. Never ever try to visit it. That is the mechanism of suppression. You have suppressed your desire. Okay. Now in otherwise uh, no uh, real life experience, you are aware of your desire, you express your desire, it is partly fulfilled, it might not be fulfilled. That is one state. The second state, when you are very aware that this is a dangerous desire okay, and therefore you cover it up, you do not try to open it up any time. But you are aware of your desire and you are also aware that I have tried to cover it. That is the state of suppression. Repression is a state when you had the desire but you never ever came to know about it because this was repressed. Before it is like say uh, you have the soil, you have shown the seed and before the seedling sprouts you again you know cover it up. It is equivalent to that. So before the desire sprouts up there is another layer which does not allow this seedling to sprout. Okay. So the desire will never ever surface, you will never consciously be aware that this was one of my desires because you have repressed it. And why did you repress it unconsciously? Simply because you thought that this is a painful uh, experience or it is a dangerous desire and it will hurt you like anything if it resurfaces and therefore you just cover it up. Okay. Then comes another interesting uh, defense mechanism that is rationalization. Rationalization is basically a technique where the attempt is made to prove that what I did is justified okay. and therefore it is worthy of the approval of myself, you should also approve it and overall the society should also approve it. Okay. This is popularly called as uh, that uh, sour grape episode no? that happened to that fox in that uh, famous story. So, you try to plug in uh, you know, the gaps that you find in terms of your action and what was anticipated and you all attempt is made to prove that this is a justifiable act. Okay. If I ask those of you who come late to the class, why do you do that? And especially if I say that uh, no, there are there is probably a visual record of okay, who came late by how much time? Okay. 
and then uh, I'm sure all of you will have stories to say why you were late. Okay, and how? And if I say that fine, uh, no tomorrow onwards, dot at eight. Okay, the gate will be closed and no one will be allowed to enter the room. Okay, you will have justification, no? That why, although you said this, but why you should be given, uh, no, a waiver from this clause? Okay, it's equivalent to first assignment and when the day it was announced that do not submit it anymore. Okay, three, four of you came here to justify that how important it is for you to resubmit it. Okay. Uh, study I made the announcement that second assignment do not submit it anymore. Okay, still I received two mails and finally I had to write a mail to all of you okay, that now no more submissions. Okay. There is uh, no, always a tendency in us as human beings to say that fine you have put a clause, but you know I qualify for a waiver. Because the situation that I am in okay, is justified, it is rational. Surprisingly what you will find is that people on other the opposite side of the fences, they also sometimes know or in most of the situations, they will also have no different justifications for the act that they are involved in. Say uh, take the uh, December 2012 episode in Delhi and elsewhere in the country, when you know that uh, say the police has drawn a line by putting a barricade that the student protesters cannot cross this line, should not cross this line. Okay. A police will always have a justification why it had to use water cannons, why it was forced to use lati charge, why it was forced to resort to you know, excessive usage of tear gas shells. Okay. Simply because you are standing on the other side of the line. Those who are standing on this side of the line, they have another justification why the police should not have uh, no used water cannon, okay. why you did not deserve uh, lati charges, why you did not deserve uh, tear gases. Okay. Uh, one of the police constables died in that episode no? and then there was two version. No? These are interesting dynamics that you find in rationalization. No? People who are on contrasting sides okay, have their interesting justifications. And it goes to the extent of saying as an individual, okay, because these are defense mechanisms are supposed to cater to your need. No? So, at a larger level what you intend to say to others is, let us see I uh, no, did it because this was worth doing in this type of situation and you give reason for that and you also you know, advocate that this is how things should be done. So, next time others should also you know, replicate my form of behavior. Then comes the next uh, defense mechanism that is projection. Projection is equivalent to this mechanism no? where the actual content lies somewhere else, but it is shown somewhere else. Okay. Now, if you look at this mechanism right from my external drive to my laptop to the LCD projector to the screen. Okay. So, there are intermediate uh, no, um, systems that has been put in. But the real content which lies somewhere else is projected somewhere else. Projection is uh, no, uh, as a defense mechanism is also exactly the same, no? where you put blame upon others or you attribute your own unethical desire to others. Why am I like this? Because you did so to me. This is projection. No? Hmm? Every time, every time in the case of uh, you know, projection when it is used as a defense, what people do is that they will uh, you know, choose somebody who was somewhere associated in some form for the type of uh, attribute that the individual is showing and then you project the blame. Okay. You remember uh, when we were looking at the range of uh, reactions in one given situation. At that time also we had discussed uh, no, rationalization, we had discussed uh, projection, we had also discussed fantasy, do you remember? That episode when we said that uh, uh, no, relatively uh, older woman uh, who uh, has not been able to uh, uh, produce an offspring, okay, which is uh, 
desired by at most uh, very highly desired by uh, her family and the society okay fantasy you fantasize uh, that children of your neighborhood belongs to you you remember this was the example that was quoted there then rationalization you rationalize no uh, the benefits of being childless okay why was i able to achieve this much in my life because i never had to care for a child okay so childlessness you prove no that how important it was uh, to be in that state similarly projection was also discussed there that you are not able to conceive why your mother okay did not uh, no take care of you when you were a growing adolescent girl she didn't uh, no uh, cater you properly you were not given proper nutrients by your family members okay your mother didn't uh, tell you x your didn't mother, your mother didn't tell you y so the full blame is shifted to somebody else okay you do not get the grade that you expect okay uh, a recent tendency that has been seen in uh, the student community here uh, no uh, since last one or two two years i would say no that a small segment will come up saying that fine uh, i thought i would get this grade but i don't know why i had slide it back okay and you have all the reasons for that no um occasionally we do come across students you no know, who will uh, you know put their demand beforehand okay last semester there was a student in this course who wrote after seeing the end sem sheets where he had performed utterly uh, badly okay immediately wrote a mail to me you know that uh, how hard he has been working throughout the semester and uh, the rational for getting at least a b okay uh, but unfortunately he got the grade which usually nobody would expect to get you know, the lowest on the uh, uh, continuum but there is a mechanism of grading okay and based on that mechanism you have fallen in the category x and therefore you get it but you yourself know say that i deserved this and then you say that you know why i did not get it because this because that and finally the blame is shifted to x or y so you select somebody okay who could uh, no not be available usually to defend your her or his position okay and then you project the entire blame on him or her okay that is the mechanism of projection but interesting part of uh, no the defense mechanisms are unconsciously used you are not aware of it and therefore you use it and you are extremely happy you are able to achieve what you wanted and final the final attainment would be that you want to attain a state where the integrity of your ego remains the way it was okay we'll continue with the uh, defense mechanism tomorrow also